You know, I've been around for a while. Met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories, science and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Do ghosts exist? Should we fear the paranormal? In California, a woman is terrorized by an invisible attacker. Is she the victim of a genuine haunting? Forget the silly movies that are out there. This is real. In New England, a mother undergoes a violent transformation. Has she been possessed by a demon? It'll make a cold chill go up your spine. And a British teenager claims to see ghosts. Does she have the gift? Like the fear, it was uncontrollable. Yeah. It's a weird world. And I love it. Have you ever seen a ghost? Over 90 million North Americans claim to have done just that, and 40 million others say they have physically experienced a paranormal event. Many of these events are easily explained, but some are not only weird and inexplicable, most disturbing of all, they seem to be evidence of pure evil. Do ghosts exist? And what are they anyway? Is the paranormal something we should fear? Or is it simply, uh, hogwash? August 8th, 1989. Barry Taff, one of the world's leading paranormal investigators, responds to the call of a distressed woman in San Pedro, California. He brings along a colleague, photographer Jeff Wheatcraft. After 5,000 cases, you go out expecting nothing to happen. And most of the time, that's exactly what does occur. Nothing. The terrified woman is Jackie Hernandez, a single mother, who claims that someone or something has turned her home into a living hell. She reported apparitions of an old man, strange lights. Somebody tried to smother her a couple times. Things were flying at her. It was extraordinary. But perhaps most chilling, on several occasions, Jackie claims to have seen a corpse in her son's bed. Intrigued, the ghost hunters decide to look around. I have this attitude where I'm very skeptical because you know that a lot of people embellish and exaggerate and misrepresent what's going on. But in Jackie's house, they find something unexpected and very weird. We were taking pictures all over the house and we saw this strange liquid, I don't know what, viscous liquid dripping out of a wall. Unable to explain the weird slime, Taff is now convinced Jackie is not faking anything and real paranormal activity is occurring in her home. They take samples and promise to return. But just three days later, another call. This time, it's an emergency. Whatever is in Jackie's house is on a rampage. The physical attacks have become so violent and severe, she fears for her life. I was unavailable because my father had a heart attack, so they were there without me. Jackie reports the evil entity is now in her attic. It has been tormenting her with strange lights and ear-shattering banging. Jeff and Gary decide to investigate. Nothing could prepare them for what they find. They hear, oh, like a yell or a moan, and Gary turned back what happened to Jeff. 
and he couldn't see. It was too dark in the attic. Despite his terror, Gary snapped some photos in the darkness. What they reveal will haunt them forever. You can see that Jeff, a six foot two man, about 215 pounds, something has wrapped itself around his neck and it's pulling up him up against the rafter. And yet, there was no one there. It was Jeff and Gary. And he cut him down, he had a rope burn at his neck, it would have killed him. The question is, there was no one else there, so what, try to kill him, how and why? Something had tried to murder Jeff Wheatcraft. The investigators leave the house only to make another chilling discovery. The forensic lab report on the ooze from Jackie's walls is in. The conclusion was it was human blood plasma. That's something you will lose sleep over, literally. Jackie's story became known as the San Pedro haunting, one of the most mysterious paranormal events in history. But what really happened? Javier Ortega is a paranormal researcher. He has no doubt. The Jackie Hernandez case is a very extreme case of a haunting. It's usually uh, the spirit of a deceased person, a homeowner that passed away in that house and they were so attached to a physical object or location that they come back. During the investigation of the Jackie Hernandez case, she reported that her and some friends were playing with the Ouija board and they were able to talk with the spirit in the house. And the spirit had told them that he was a Marine that was murdered. So they went out and they did some research and they found out that there was a, a Marine named Herman Hendrickson who was found dead in 1930. A lot of the things that were reported were apparitions, you know, whether it was a disembodied head floating in the attic or a, uh, a corpse-like old man sitting in, in her child's bed. Uh, she, she also reported seeing strange lights. They were described as globs of, of luminous light. Free-floating globs of light have been reporting in, in haunted places as well. But for Ortega, the most compelling evidence of a haunting is that mysterious goo Barry and Jeff found oozing from Jackie's walls. I mean, it, it just sounds so, so bizarre, you know, that you would have human blood plasma oozing from the walls. And when they checked, there wasn't any device that, you know, that was emitting this substance. Was the Marine so angry about being murdered that he bled through Jackie's walls? Incredibly, Ortega thinks Jackie wasn't the only victim. When Jackie Hernandez left the premise, people who inhabited that home have also reported strange activities. Uh, they reported objects being moved around, pots and pans being moved around, and they re reported being uh, touched. What an incredible story. Yeah, well, I mean, strange things happen around my house too, but once I say I'm sorry, everything's forgiven. But human blood? Dripping from walls and a spirit that is so angry it tries to kill you? I mean, who are they going to call? Ghostbusters? <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. A terrified woman reports extreme paranormal events in her home. Weird lights, strange noises, even physical attacks. Did Jackie Hernandez live in a haunted house? It does not appear that the house would fit the classic haunting. Lloyd Auerbach is a paranormal investigator. He believes the answer isn't ghosts at all. Knowing what I about, know about the Jackie Hernandez case, it seemed that she herself was a poltergeist agent. Poltergeist? Isn't that just a hyperactive ghost? Or is there a difference? What we learned in the last hundred years is that these things relate typically not to ghost sightings, not to hauntings per se, not to a place being haunted, but to a person, an individual in the situation who is typically stressed or otherwise put upon. There's possibly epileptic or having epileptic type, type activity. It's about a third, perhaps, of the cases. And the expression, instead of by an entity, is by the entity in the body. It's by a person's unconscious blowing off steam or act, having a seizure, essentially. It's kind of like a seizure in some of these people as well. But it's not a ghost-related situation. Many now believe poltergeists are not ghosts, but a manifestation of something called psychokinesis. We call it PK for short. And it's the idea that the mind can directly interact or affect matter and energy. We typically think of it in the paranormal world as affecting things outside your body, whether it be moving objects, what people often call telekinesis, or bending metal, or even healing. 
Was Jackie Hernandez herself causing the weird phenomenon in her own house? If so, why? And for that matter, how? Certain people, their unconscious minds let loose. I mean, we see people who are stressed out, who are put upon in society, in really expressing that stress in different ways. Some people get enraged and they break things. Some people shoot people. Some people keep it bottled up and it can explode in kind of a different direction for certain individuals, which is a psychokinetic direction. And we call those situations where they're stressed, they're, they're, think of it as an unconscious temper tantrum. It's happening outside themselves and just starts throwing things around, probably like they'd like to do if they actually physically could do it. But by having their unconscious throw things around, who's gonna get blamed? The invisible force, the invisible ghost, certainly not the person who's stressed out. When we talk about the stress involved in these PK events, which are often called poltergeist cases, we're not talking about typical stress of, you know, just day-to-day -day stress, uh, sitting in traffic, uh, being frustrated because your computer couldn't work, which may actually be related back to the PK. Those kinds of stresses do show in small ways sometimes, but they can, again, come out in a lot of different ways. For example, road rage, or people just screaming at the driver across, you know, the way without acting on it. Those, you release that stress. People have other ways of doing it. In poltergeist cases, the stresses tend to be very psychologically oriented in most of these cases. So they can be related to deep-seated issues around the family or even around the working conditions. Uh, they are typically not expressed in other ways. So there's no outlet for most of these people. Was Jackie's unconscious mind throwing a temper tantrum? And if so, why? It could be due to the fact she was experiencing emotional issues at the time following a difficult divorce. There was enough going on in her life and frankly enough psychological issues that would indicate that she was responsible for most of the phenomena that was happening. In most poltergeist cases, people rarely ever think of themselves as the agent. According to Auerbach, the most compelling argument that Jackie was both the victim and the problem is what happened when she moved 600 kilometers away. Incredibly, the vicious paranormal attacks on her continued. In poltergeist cases, when people move, the phenomena follows them because it's coming from them. And that also happened in that particular case. But if Jackie was her own poltergeist, how is it that the new tenants also reported paranormal attacks. Could it be that Jackie herself was responsible for the weird goings on? Or were they the result of an altogether different kind of bad vibe? Professor John Huntington believes the Jackie Hernandez case can be explained by undetectable audio waves known as infrasound. Sound is just the vibration in air pressure. That's how we perceive it. Uh, that's how it gets into your ear. Infrasound is below the range that we can hear as an audible sound, but it is, we're still being affected by the, the sound wave is still impinging on our bodies. In fact, right now in the room, we have a pretty loud uh, 19 hertz, uh, 19 cycle per second infrasound wave going, but it's not, very, uh, it's not really audible as a sound, and it's quite a bit louder the, than the speech, the, the level of the speech that I'm talking at right now. But it's still there, and it's still affecting us. It's still pressurizing the air uh, that, we're, that I'm breathing, that I'm speaking. Human ears can't detect ultra-low frequencies. If it's below 20 hertz, you can't hear it. But other than our own bodies, what might cause these low frequencies? Man-made sources of infrasound could be anything from a piece of air handling equipment in a building, anything like a train, a truck, Anything that's big stuff that's moving could generate these very low, low frequency sounds. Incredibly, Huntington believes low frequency sound waves could have caused Jackie Hernandez's unpleasant experiences. So in addition to things like headaches and nausea being caused by exposure to infrasound, there have been some reports of feeling a presence or some sort of hallucination or feeling like strange things are going on in the room. Uh, a lot of that was documented by two researchers at Coventry University, uh, Tandy and Lawrence, in the late 90s. They were working in a space, sort of an underground uh, space, as I understand it, um, and they had all kinds of uh, just strange experiences. People would think that somebody was standing next to them, and when there wasn't anybody in the room, they'd be feeling alone and felt like there was a presence in the room, uh, and there wasn't anybody else there. All kinds of strange experiences uh, happening in this one space. Uh, after and this would build up, of course, would build up anxiety, being having these sort of constant um, 
uh, sort of strange experiences. And then one of the researchers brought a, a fencing foil into the room to work on and clamped it into a vise and it started moving on its own. And it was, uh, it was sort of flopping up and down at both ends where it wasn't secured in the vise. That led the Tandy and Lawrence to research this and they ended up doing some acoustical measurements in the room and found that a piece of air handling equipment was causing a very loud uh, 19 cycle per second uh, infrasound sound wave in the room. And in addition, the, the physical geometry of the space was causing the, uh, that sound wave to build up in certain locations in the lab. Can infrasound exposure mimic the experience of a haunting? And infrasound could possibly cause something like a hallucination or an apparition or some other things like that based on the vibration of the sound wave actually affecting the eye. The eye itself could resonate or get a very strong sort of vibration and that could cause boring of vision or possible issues around the periphery of the vision. Those things coupled with already being in sort of a spooky location, being on edge by the infrasound could certainly cause some sort of ghostly experiences. Was Jackie's home haunted, or was she her own poltergeist? Whatever the answer, this story is certainly weird. What? A Connecticut housewife is tortured from within. Has she been possessed by an evil spirit? Demons like to attack good people. Many of us have experienced events that we would call paranormal, but in fact are just things that are harmless and easily explained. But what is the paranormal? And does it exist? Even the name is a little, well, weird and scary. Here's the way it's described in the dictionary. Paranormal, the claimed occurrence of an event without scientific explanation. As psychokinesis. Extrasensory perception of other purportedly supernatural phenomena. All right, guys, come on, that's it, out. You can fool some, oh boy, oh boy. But some people experience paranormal events that are real. So real, in fact, they're deadly. Weird. Or what? History professor John Kerner studies reports of paranormal activity. None have haunted him more than the story of Patricia Redding. By all accounts, she was a good person. I mean, there's nothing you can see in her past that would indicate why this happens to her. In 1992, Patricia's life took a terrifying turn. Doing chores around her home in Litchfield, Connecticut, she suddenly hears a terrifying voice. Worship Satan. She felt what she thought was an evil presence that was around her. There was nothing that could explain this. Patricia tries to brush it off, but the eerie voice won't stop, ever. It's the beginning of a horrifying ordeal. Stop. The situation got much, much worse. Pet had a number of things that were happening to her that were very unusual. There were bite marks on the back of her neck, bruises on the back of her body, things she could not do by herself. What could be inflicting Patricia's vicious bruises and other injuries? It's a frightening and bizarre mystery. Devastated and disturbed, she seeks help. The family took Patricia Redding to the hospital, to local doctors. They ruled out all the conditions that could possibly be affecting her. With no medical explanation, Patricia resorts to hoping her problems will simply go away. But then things started getting much worse after that. She was knocked over horribly. She did not know what is happening. Again and again, the seemingly evil presence hurls her into the wall. These are things that never could happen to Pat Running in a normal situation. She is not herself. She's becoming someone else. Fearing for her safety, Patricia has only one place to turn. 
At that point, the Catholic Church got involved. Patricia's bishop takes her claims seriously. After an examination, he reaches an incredible conclusion. They make the diagnosis, yes, she is possessed. Demons like to attack good people. There's only one solution, an ancient ritual as old as the church itself. The bishop decides he will perform an exorcism. He called upon the demon to reveal himself and say who you are, reveal yourself in the name of Jesus Christ. Almost every, every religion really believes in evil in some form or another. But the difference with the Catholic Church is that the Catholic Church believes evil is actually a physical manifestation in this world. It's not just a concept. At first, the demon stays hidden, but not for long. <laughs> She was speaking in a language that she could not speak in normally, trying to insult the priest, insult his family, things that she never would have done at home. These are pretty clear signs you're dealing with the evil entity inside the person's body. Having forced the demon into the open, the real battle begins. Things like holy objects, this often can anger the demon. These are tools in a war that can cause them to be so upset. The words of Christ makes them so angry. So it has to be said over and over again. It's a war of attrition. The battle rages for hours. At long last, something breaks. Demons, they get so upset, they just can't take this any longer, and they'll go somewhere else. They'll go bother somebody else. The exhausting battle ends with the demons on the run. But before long, they're back. Evil is real. It can affect someone in some horrible ways. Sadly, Patricia runs out of time. After 16 exorcisms, in 2005, she dies of cancer, believed to be caused by her demons. Christopher Rossi is a psychologist. He says he knows exactly what happened to Patricia Redding. Coming from a religious perspective, you might assume that this must be a, a demonic uh, presence. But as a psychologist, my diagnosis would be dissociative identity disorder. Better known as a split personality, dissociative identity disorder is when two or more personalities inhabit one mind. An abusive childhood can sometimes cause such a psychological break. One personality becomes the happy face, the person the world sees. The other deals with all the hidden pain, shame, and suffering. The primary personality is unaware of the other personality. They may hear voices and have these sort of signs, but they don't know what it's about. Can psychology explain the power of an exorcism? After the exorcism, the individual experiences complete and sudden uh, remission of their symptoms. And, of course, that's considered proof positive that the demon has been removed. An alternative way of looking at that, however, is that the, the prayer, the ritual, is in fact to serve to rearrange these separate identities such that they have receded from the host's awareness. They don't hear the voice anymore. Then what I experience happening with some patients is that maybe weeks or months later, the voices come back. Everything I'm saying here is in no way meant to malign the, the value of religious, spiritual care. But there are some psychological ways of understanding these experiences that really should be taken into account. Demonic possession. Ordinary people suddenly possessed by nasty entities. Ring a bell? Ah, you know, I've seen all the movies. Omen, one, two, three, The Exorcist, a lot. And guess what? Not only do they not scare me, I don't believe them. I mean, just because it gets a little stormy, doesn't mean the devil is on his way to take over your soul, does it? And as for all that other ridiculous stuff like twisting heads, speaking in strange tongues, woof, with me, they didn't agree. Oh, what? Is demonic possession all in our heads? Or 
But is there a more frightening answer? Reverend Bob Larson is not your average man of God. I am, among other things, an exorcist. Larson has studied Patricia Redding's possession and is convinced it was real. There are those who would like to have the public believe that demonic possession is rare. I can tell you, it's not rare. It'll make a cold chill go up your spine. Are demons really all around us? Are they trying to take over the bodies of innocent humans? The Bible teaches that when Satan was cast out of heaven, a third of the angels involved in that insurrection were cast out with him. According to the book of Revelation, when Satan lost his war with God, he and his followers were banished to the spirit realm on earth. Satan is now an invisible spirit being. Satan can't pull the trigger of a gun, but what Satan can do is invade human bodies, and those people then become the instruments of evil. Larson believes demonic possession has a firm basis in scripture. He's also certain that Patricia's condition wasn't a case of split personality. I deal a lot with multiple personality disorder. I know the difference. When you see the demon have such utter hatred for God and religious objects such as the cross, that aversion means it's something more than psychosis. That's when you know they are possessed. But there's one thing Larson believes is the ultimate proof of demonic presence. In the Pat Reading case, she apparently spoke in another language. I've seen this happen thousands and thousands of times. I had a woman speak Chinese one time. I had a fascinating case where a strange language was being spoken and a college professor with a PhD in ancient Semitic languages. He said, I can come up and tell you exactly what the voice was saying. And he did and the voice was speaking about his possession of the person and how it was determined to destroy them. Now this was a PhD college professor who was giving testimony to it. Could these foreign, even forgotten languages prove that Satan is carrying on an age old war by invading the bodies of humans? To the skeptics who may not believe in demonic possession, I say travel with me and meet the thousands of people who have had exorcisms. When you see the smile and the glow on the person's face as they say to you, wow, I didn't know I could feel like this. Something is gone. That's why I do exorcisms. I don't know about you, but stories of ghosts and the paranormal send shivers up my spine. But that's kind of fun, right? But do spirits or ghosts or whatever they are always have to be evil? Aren't there any friendly dead people out there? I hope so. But there's some people who not only enjoy having ghosts around, they can talk to them whenever they like. How? Got the gift. In just about every way, Faye Jackson is an average teenage girl. I like to shop and just hang out with my friends. While Faye's life appears to be ordinary in truth, she and her family are dealing with something so sensitive they've chosen to conceal their appearance. Although it has become part of everyday life for us, it is still at times frightening. Faye's story began three years ago when she was 10. I was sitting in my bedroom on my own. I could feel a man sitting next to me. She could feel like an energy, like a presence next to her. And I could just feel his breath in my ear and it was all warm. And then she heard him whispering in her ear. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hear me? Faye races to her mom. Like the fear, I, I just, it was like uncontrollable. I just, it was unexplainable. The child was absolutely terrified. And I was scared for her, to be honest. When Lynn takes her daughter back to the room, the man is gone. But Faye is in no doubt as to what she's experienced. I saw my first ghost. Terrifyingly, Faye's encounter was just the beginning. 
The spirits started regularly visiting me. They'd only come when I was on my own, and when they did, just random spirits would walk into my bedroom. Faye is haunted by hundreds of ghosts. Sometimes she sees as many as five a night. Sometimes they just want to show her how they died, which is a little bit grim at times, and she's only 13. The ghosts begin getting bolder. There was an incident when her bed was shook, which completely terrified me. I just felt like I was being attacked. It was horrible. It, was, it felt really dangerous, and I felt like I was on my own. That was when I knew we had to do something about it. At her wit's end, Lynn seeks professional advice. We got lots of help from local mediums who understood what was happening. Far from seeing it as something frightening, the mediums tell them Faye's ability to see and connect with the dead is a gift, and a very rare one at that. Um, they taught Faye techniques that she could use to take more of a control over her gift and to see it as a gift, really. With the help of psychic mediums, the support of her mother, and lots of hard work, Faye finally mastered her gift. It's like I have two lives. Like, I live one life where I'm just a normal girl, and then other times I can talk to spirits. So it's really quite exciting. I see dead people. That's something else I've always wanted to say, but I can't because I don't. Well, not when I'm sober anyway. But incredibly, it may be because I'm an adult. You see, Faye isn't alone. Millions of other children see dead people too. How? Do they possess a special power, a sixth sense? And is it a gift or a curse? Weird. Or what? 13-year-old Faye Jackson claims she can see ghosts. Do children possess the gift? Who better to ask about children who see ghosts than Karen Good, author of Children Who See Ghosts. To discover that children see ghosts and talk with ghosts, to me it was exciting. After more than 25 years researching the special abilities of young minds, Good has reached an incredible conclusion. Children are more predisposed to see ghosts than adults are, primarily because of their brain power. The sixth sense begins to develop in children between the ages of 18 months all the way up through five to six years. And the reason is because their, their brain is going through a tremendous growth spurt. We've all heard of the sixth sense, but what is it? What does it do that your other five can't? When I discuss with a parent, for example, what is the sixth sense? I explain it to a parent as being intuitive intelligence. Some people have a heightened intuition, particularly um, sensitive children. We call them sensitive because they may be sensitive to the feelings of someone who might be ill or a child one child that I'm aware of used to tell me about he would know a car accident when his mom was driving. He would get nauseated, and it always correlated for him with a nearby car accident. So I think that a sixth sense involves feeling and intuition, and it could involve heightened sensitivities. But where does this sixth sense come from? Is it a gift only bestowed on some? Remarkably, Good believes it's an ability that's within us all. The pineal gland is located within the brain, which actually regulates light within our body. I believe the pineal gland can be a doorway to the sixth sense. But if we all have the ability to access our sixth sense, why do so few children maintain this power into adulthood? As the hormones change, children go through brainwave shifts, mood shifts, and that's the time logic develops. And children may turn away from their intuition, their feelings. 
If children have not been encouraged in their imagination, in their conversations, and sixth sense development, it can shut down when cognition sets in. Psychic Jack Rourke is an expert in parapsychology. Experience has taught him that a far more mundane explanation may be at work or rather at home. There is a phenomenon called parentizing where, in essence, there's a bit of a role reversal where a child can sometimes become the caretaker of the parent or become the mirror to the parent. Rourke believes that through parentizing, children can be actively encouraged to say they see ghosts. The more positive reinforcement a child gets from their parent that they are special, that they are extra sensitive, that they have special empathic or intuitive abilities, the more the child then believes they're psychic. And I'll give you an example of how this is done. A child wakes up in the middle of the night from a horrible dream and is talking about ghosts, chasing them, things like this. You come in as the parent and say, no, you're wrong, that didn't happen. You lose the ability to comfort the child because they've been made wrong. Now, I go into the room, same scenario, and I say, oh, you saw a ghost, didn't you? <laughs> yes. This is how it's done. But why would a child like Faye go along with the idea of seeing ghosts? What's in it for her? The specialness of the child in these circumstances gives the child permission to commiserate with the parent. They become their emotional partner. Um, they go to activities together. They may go to certain psychic functions. And this unique relationship becomes a reward to the child. And in order to maintain that closeness with their parent, they have to maintain the psychic identity. For the parent, this also gives them passive means to control the child. And also, what I've witnessed is a way to, to slow down their development and prolong their childhood. Um, so this is an interesting thing, one of the things that we look at. Um, now, why per se a child might have a specific uh, experience? It could be biological, it could be an environmental reason, it could just be an ordinary bad dream. Can you hear me, can you hear me, can you hear me, can you hear me? Are children who see ghosts merely playing out a fantasy with the encouragement of their parents? Is there nothing special about them at all? Does the gift exist in children at all? Thousands of children across the globe claim they can see dead people. Do they have an extra special sense known as the gift? Paranormal investigator Joshua P. Warren believes there could be a medical explanation for this phenomenon. A person like Faye may be capable of seeing ghosts because she has some physiological advantage in her eyeballs themselves. Could Faye's eye have powers the rest of ours don't? Warren believes her secret may be that she sees light differently. Right now, all the data that we have indicates ghosts are more visible in the infrared realm. Some of the best ghost images I've seen have been captured using infrared technology. Could Faye be seeing ghosts that are all around us? Ghosts that most of us miss because we can't see infrared? The average person can only see a relatively narrow band of light from usually around green to red. Faye might be able to see a little bit more than the rest of us. Scientists call the range of light the visible spectrum, although most of us know it as the colors of the rainbow. But what if Faye was somehow able to literally see what the rest of us can't? In the human eye, there are two primary types of cells. You've got the rod cells and the cone cells. Rod cells are used for nighttime vision, but they can't see color. Then you have the cone cells, which respond very quickly, and they see color. If Faye has more of those rod or cone cells, especially the cones, that alone might allow her to see a broader range of colors and frequencies than the average person. 
Her eyes physiologically allow her to peer deeper into the infrared or ultraviolet realms. Incredibly, Warren also believes the eye might not just explain Faye's story, but also why children on average report seeing more ghosts than adults. As a person ages, the components of the eye become more and more dense. In extreme cases, they can become very cloudy and form a cataract. So the older you get, the less you're able to, to see when it comes to this band of frequencies. Children are not only able to see a wider range of frequencies, but they also should have an open mind and open awareness. They have not been structured so much yet into a belief system and into a, a task-driven day-to-day routine that gives us tunnel vision as adults. Uh, as children, they still have a wider awareness and perception of what's around them and the willingness to acknowledge honestly what they see. Could Faye and other children like her really be able to see into the infrared world of ghosts? Does she have a sixth sense? Or is Faye just a needy kid who wanted her mother's attention and approval? We may never know. Weird. Or what? So there we have it, ghost stories from around the world. A Californian woman's home plays host to one of the most terrifying paranormal events on record. In New England, a woman is possessed by an evil spirit so strong, even the Catholic Church fails to defeat it. And a British teenager can see and talk to ghosts. Is she proof that some children have the gift? Are these bizarre stories evidence that ghosts exist? Can we seek comfort in rational explanations? Or do we ignore them at our peril? You decide. Join me again next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what? Yeah. <laughs>